Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and obviously I've got Kay with me. Hello Kay. Hello everybody. <laughs> and of course this is the night sky and we've got that other bloke with us as well. Um, what other bloke? <laughs> <laughs> Keith Austin. Right. Hello, Keith. Yes, it's Keith. Little fella that pops up in the middle. <laughs> yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay, so what we're going to have a look at tonight is, well, I should really start off by talking about that big bright star that you can immediately see. Everyone's probably noticed it in the sky. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not a star at all. It's actually the planet Venus. I was just down in Christchurch and um, talking to someone that I met at a service station. She has said, what is that big bright light? I, I keep seeing just after the sun. I said, uh, that's that. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a star, that is the planet Venus. Yeah. Oh, is that Venus? That's right, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, we only see it there about every three years, and because it, it, as it moves further away from the sun, we see more and more, it, it stays up longer, and it gets brighter and brighter. So that's the evening star that we're seeing. All right, so it's the planet Venus. All right, now, what I thought today was that uh, we talk about the Southern Cross. I guess it's, if people know any constellation in the sky, it's the Southern Cross, which incidentally is the smallest constellation in the sky, all right? But also at this moment of time, uh, in the early evening, it's getting to its highest point up there. So let's see what, what's the importance, why, what's so special about the Southern Cross. Well, for those of you watching this on TV, you can see a, an aerial view of Stonehenge and Stonehenge sitting near the centre is the obelisk. Now the obelisk is a, a needle of stone, as the ancient Egyptians believed it to be. All right? And when you look at this, this obelisk, it casts a shadow on the ground during the daytime on a sunny day, and the shadow alone shows you exactly uh, what the date is, the length of the day, which incidentally varies, a day is, a, is a 24 hours is now only an average length of the day. And, but it also shows you where the sun is amongst the stars and the star signs and so on and so forth. And this is all done by shadows. And as I always like to point out to people, this isn't something that was discovered a century or two ago. This is something that was discovered thousands of years ago. But as you look at the obelisk, you'll notice it's got a hole in it. All right? Well, if you come around and look at it, the hole's at an angle and it points to a spot in the sky. And this hole is lined up also with the top point of the obelisk. And it points up to what was known as the South Celestial Pole. Now the South Celestial Pole is the point in the heavens around which, which indeed, which it appears the entire heavens appears to rotate. And now for those of you watching this on TV, you can see a long exposure to photograph of the obelisk with the background stars and they're drawing trails as everything appears to rotate around that, that spot in the sky. <laughs> now if you're not sure what that spot is, if you were standing at the South Pole, right, that spot would be directly overhead because it's not the sky that's turning around, it's the Earth. And what you're looking at is the Earth's axis projected into space. But once you're able to identify that spot in the sky, well, you know that you're looking due south, right? So if you drop immediately down, there's absolute due south. And that's the way in which it, why it, it's important there, okay? But you could also work out your latitude because that spot in the sky where the south celestial pole is, is always a number of degrees above the horizon equal to the latitude at which you're standing. Mm. So if you were standing at the south pole, it would be directly overhead. It would be 90 degrees above the horizon, you would be looking at latitude, no, you would be standing at latitude 90, yeah. If you come down to Stonehenge and you actually measured that, that altitude, you find it's 41 degrees above the horizon. That's the latitude mm. of Stonehenge RTRR. All right. And this is all done by the stars. And I said, this is stuff that's done a long, long time ago. Now, some of you may have gathered that I come from England by my accent, and perhaps the most important sign in the sky that you can pick out in, in uh, the northern hemisphere <coughs> it's called the big dipper it's actually part of the part of the constellation of the great bear and the reason why the polaris is uh, sorry the big dipper is so important it like the southern cross moves around the part north pole is the south pole but it points at a big bright star all right 
and that star is called Polaris. It's the North Star. And the North Star, so-called, because it virtually sits within about a degree of the North Celestial Pole. So once you can see Polaris, it's always at the same spot from the same latitude. You know when you're looking at it, you're looking due north, all right? So that's a marker, right? But down here in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have anything like that, all right? That uh, looks... Let's go with that bigger. If we, we look at... We, we can't see... We've got no big bright star like Polaris sitting near the South Celestial Pole. And this, folks, of course, is where the Southern Cross comes in. Because our distant ancestors discovered that they could use the Southern Cross to locate that spot in the sky. Now, for those of you watching this on TV, you can see uh, the night sky looking south around about six o'clock tonight, right? And you can pick out the cross. It's pretty easy, almost directly overhead. And it's followed by the two pointer stars, which point to it, right? Now, if you draw a line, from the Southern Cross, better put you on again, from the Southern Cross, you eventually reach another bright star. That's called Achenar. And it's dead easy to pick, folks, because it's the only bright star in that region of the sky. Come halfway in between, approximately halfway in between the two, between the Southern Cross and Achenar, is the South Celestial Pole the point around which the entire heavens rotates in the southern hemisphere. Drop from that high point to the horizon and you're looking due south, right? So this is the importance of the Southern Cross because for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, our ancestors have been using the Southern Cross to be able to locate that south point. And once you got south, of course, you know north, east and west. Mm. You have other important points. And I often use that method myself. Um, the point between uh, Crux and Achena, and you just draw this vertical line straight down. And I often use that uh, myself when I'm out at night looking at the stars, um, just so I can orient myself so, oh. so I know if I'm not, exactly where I am. If I'm not at home, because I already know where north, east, and south, west, but if I'm anywhere else, I always use that straight away. It's the first thing you use it to do. And of course, if you're a navigator, this was all important. I think I've got to, I've put a little animation showing you how it all works here, okay? So that's, that's how the stars move around the south celestial pole. Right? <laughs> not quite that fast. No, not quite that fast. Okay, right. Now, stars within 41 degrees of the South Celestial Pole, here, here in New Zealand where we are, right, that's our latitude, never set. They just move in a big circle. Stars beyond that point rise and set, okay? So, as I said, this is the stars we're looking at at the moment at 6 p.m. tonight, and we drop down to Achenar. All right, as the evening goes on, those stars will gradually move round as the Earth rotates. I sometimes so, imagine it as like a giant clock hand. It is, it is. Yes. Uh, midnight, of course, it's going to be virtually laying on its side. All right? But no matter, so long as you can see the Southern Cross in the sky, you'll be able to see Achenar. Mm. And that means you can work out absolute due south. It goes by 15 degrees an hour, doesn't it? Some, something like that, yeah. Because yeah. if you divide 360 yeah. by... 12. And it also, it also meant that our, our ancestors could immediately, once they picked up those stars, they had their coordinates, and of course they could also work out their latitude, all right, in which they were, all right. So, so due south is underneath, so we're at 41 degrees. Well, how did our ancient Polynesian sailors do that, you see, because they didn't have an obelisk on board their ship, did they, Kay? No, <laughs> they had a mass though. So they had to, they had to work out what their what their their latitude was, and the how the way in which they did it was actually using their hands. So they could use the stars at night, all right. And once you could see the stars, well, you could use your hand to work out the latitude you're at. Now, if you spread out your fingers as far as they would go at right angles and st stretch your arm out, okay. Well, from the tip of your thumb to your little finger, that's roughly 20 degrees, right? Mm. 
then close your fist from, knuckle, from one end of your knuckles to the others, 10 degrees. Now have a look at your thumb, at arm's length, that's two degrees. Your little finger is one degree. Mm. And you see, it doesn't matter what you, because all our bodies tend to be built, built in proportion. So if a, you've got a big man and a short man, all right, they're going to have different size hands, all right, but their arm, once you take their arm lengths, you'll find that because their bodies are built in proportion, their hand will give them exactly the same yes, dimensions. Yes, it all compensates. Yes, yeah. it will, yeah. So that's, that's what it was. So all he did was stand on the side of the ship and use his, his hand to climb down the stars. And once you became skilled at that, that's all you needed to navigate across the greatest ocean on earth. A knowledge of the stars and those little finger things stuck on it. Sounds there. like very rough and ready approximate, but obviously it works because they used it to navigate uh, some of the, you know, the trackless Pacific Ocean. Mm. And uh, when you consider it, that's quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, but, yeah because um, I think we, we, we tend to forget what it would have been like. Imagine how it was. Uh, you really only needed ago. it when you moved away from the equator. Yeah. If you were moving along the equator, you were following the lines of the stars, and they were called the stars that eat the land because you would track one star from one place to another and yeah. arrive at that island. But when you move either north or south of that, that's when you've got to use these other techniques. Yeah. Yeah, because you're moving down across different equatorial lines, not that they yeah. called them that necessarily. They would have um, referred to the stars that marked them. Right. Mm. But I, I was going to say is that you, uh, to me it's a bit unmanageable. When we, when we sail out on a boat now or plane now, we know exactly where we're going and there's mm. going to be people waiting out there. Imagine what it was like for the early explorers sailing out to the sea and not knowing what was on the, beyond the horizon. Yes, it was what, pretty what, much the same when they uh, shut off the, the uh, satellite communication when they had the 9-11 because people were out there on their big boats and sure they'd learnt celestial navigation but never practiced it for a very long time mm. and there were great big boats out there sailing <laughs> well you know powering along these great big enormous things without really knowing exactly where they were because they hadn't kept up their their skills yeah mm. yeah and uh, incidentally, as far as navigation is concerned, how it worked is that our ancestors were much more familiar with their their sky and their environment than we were. We see the, for example, we see the Pacific as a single body of the water. Our ancestors didn't. Mm. They make, the Pacific was broken up into about six bodies, I think it was, okay? Depends whose ancestors yeah. you're talking about yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> but what I mean, uh, in breaking, Maori and Polynesian, yes, there were... They were quite aware of the different bodies of water. In, in fact, case. some of them are marked now by clutters of rubbish which are on the surface. Yeah, but the, what they beach. had in those days were a different population of fish and so on and so oh, forth. Oh, yeah, because they were different temperatures, different salinity, mm. and so therefore different populations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and the, you different, were, different biodiversity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And of course, you've all, all of you all have heard of Aotearoa, like Stonehenge, Aotearoa. Yes. And um, and of course now it's being gradually adopted, which I think it should be into the the name of the country because it was the first name. And Aotearoa means land of the long white cloud. And the reason for that is that what our ancestors had noticed a long, long time ago, and I'm talking about the Polynesians here, is that you see clouds in the sky, and clouds move. Mm. But if you see a cloud in the distance that's not moving you know there's land there because clouds fall over land. Yes. And this all comes down to a boat that was sailing, just going out into the, exploring the Pacific. And this young lady on board, any Yeah, and she saw, she saw this cloud and she called out a cloud, a cloud, a long white cloud. Mm. And the word would be Aotearoa. If you ask anybody who lives close to the Alps, they'll tell you 
and I've seen it myself, you can be Tiana, places like that, and you look across at the mountain and it looks like a cresting wave. Mm. It doesn't stop. In actual fact, it's uh, the moisture in the air condensing as it rises and then disappearing again as it comes down the other side. And there's so much the air following it that you it looks like a continuous one cloud, but yeah. it's not. That's and right. it's the same thing when you're at the sea. You actually can see the islands over the horizon but yeah. long before you can see that's the right. islands themselves. But most people don't realise that's how, how important that word Aotearoa is. It was actually the discovery of these lands. And it's stuff. a navigational term. It's yeah. a lot more relevant than New Zealand because we're not flat like Holland. <laughs> we're very much not like that. Well, we're sort of named after a Zealand in Europe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't look like that. So the name, the, um, the Maori name is far more appropriate. Yeah, yeah. And of course it is the first name given yeah. to these lands and that, that's the importance of it yeah anyway uh, with that in mind uh, we're just bringing up the southern cross and i think maybe keith might better play a little tune for us would you better do that keith mm, yes well i haven't got my keyboard with me today uh, but i've got uh, my little flute you can see it here and um, the cameras aren't quite lining up with me, but you've that's got to play. Right. Here we go. That's what. Yep. <laughs> and um, haven't played this for a while. I've actually been away in Christchurch visiting family and that sort of thing. It was freezing cold down there, but it was wonderful. I hope to see some stars down there, but of course uh, there's too much of the long white cloud up in the in the um, lower atmosphere. But uh, anyway, so um, this is a um, is actually a, Scot a Scottish song called "The Dark Isle." Thank you, Keith. Well, right. we we better get back to our Southern Cross yes. now. <laughs> okay, so there's these four star bright brightish stars. Uh, I was going to take we, we we know them as a navigational beacon, yeah, but they're also uh, physical objects. So I thought we'd have a little bit of a, a look into that first of all. Now, the brightest star in the Southern Cross, the bottom one of them, is called A Crux. A for Alpha, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, alpha Chris. And uh, it, it's actually the thirteenth brightest star in the sky. Yeah. All right. Um, its distance is three hundred and twenty-three light years, and its age is about eleven million years. Now, it's a blue giant star. All right. All of these stars we see in the cross. In fact, most of the bright stars that we can see in the night sky. And not the common old garden variety of star. These are giants and shine out over the light years. Right, giant star. That's right. And, and you can tell that, particularly if you take a photograph, you can see immediately the colours of the stars. So Acrux is a blue giant star. But the interesting thing is that it's um, not one, but two stars. All right? Double star system. Yeah. And they're, they're what we call a contact binary. Two stars where the atmosphere is merged together they're so close so we can't see this in a telescope but we can we, with things like spectroscope we can detect them and see what the orbital period of them is and so on 
But together, the total amount of light coming from these stars is equal to 25,000 suns. Mm. So these stars are so close together, orbiting each other, so close together that the atmospheres from the stars are merging. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And when I, when I talk about luminosity of the stars, you remember that our bodies have evolved around the star we call the sun mm. and and the temperature of that star so the colors we see you know with our eyes are is related most is related to our sun so the most sensitive part of our eyes is in the yellow spectrum which is our sun's a yellow star consequently when we look at a blue star it's these things are so hot that most of their energy is not being emitted in the visible wavelengths like our sun is. They're being visible uh, they're in the blue ultraviolet radiation. So when I say 25,000 times brighter than the sun, that's just a visual light. The UV and X radiation beyond that is much, much greater. So uh, a theoretical creature on uh, that planet that you can see on your TV screen, if there were life forms with eyes, their eyes will be sensitive to blue and ultraviolet. Yeah, that's yes. right. Except that, the, the other thing is, we will go into this in some detail, detail later, but the bigger the star, the more rapidly it evolves. Yes. Right? And indeed, all these stars we're looking at in the Southern Cross, they're only a few tens of millions of years old. Right? And that 10 million years might sound a lot to you and me, but it's nothing. Our sun is four and a half thousand million yes. years old, okay? So these are baby stars, in a sense, okay? So there's Acrux. The second brightest star, all right, is 277 light years away. Its name is Mimosa, mm -hmm. all right? Oops. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> There's Mimosa, all right? Um, and it's the 20th brightest star in the entire sky and the second brightest star in the Southern Cross, okay? And it too is a blue giant and it's on its own, that star is 34,000 times brighter than the sun mm. and it's in visual wavelengths, yeah. So mm. you, you'll be, any planets like the Earth, of course, if the, if the Earth was, the sun was that bright, we wouldn't exist because the, all the inner planets would be vaporized. Yes. So you'd have to be at some great distance from these stars to actually survive. Okay, so that's Mimosa. Okay, now the, uh, there's one star that's not uh, bluish in color, and that's the third brightest star that's at the top of the cross, and that's Gacrux. Gamma Crucis. Gamma, yes. Gamma Crucis. Third brightest. Alpha, Beta, Gamma. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, Gacrux. And its distance is 89 light years. It's actually one of the closer than 26th brightest star in the sky. But it is a colossal red giant star. All right? Mm. And indeed, it's 1,500 times brighter than our sun. But indeed, in the future, our sun's going to look like this. Because when stars die, they reach the end of the life and they begin to use up all the hydrogen at their core. Well, hydrogen begins to burn in the shell around it and they, the star increases in brightness and expands. But it turns might from maybe from a white star into a, a red star, but its surface area is enormous. Okay. Yes. The reason why it becomes red rather than white is because the huge size is actually pushing the outer part of the star away from the nuclear reactor in its core, yeah. the nuclear reactions in its core, and so they so they are cooler, yeah. and so they uh, turn red. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, when the sun turns into a red giant, to give you an idea, it, this, the Earth may well be swallowed by the sun yes. as it expands into a red giant. So this is a good example of what the sun will be like in the, it, towards the end of its life. So that's the Grux, which is a red giant star there. Okay. And finally, we've got Imar, Delta Crucis, de or meaning Delta the fourth brightest star in the constellation of the Crux. Its distance is 346 light years. Okay, so it's uh, the most distant of the four stars. And you've got to remember, we look at this, look at all the different distances that they've got. All these things are, are many light years apart. All right, it's just the angle at which we see them in the sky. Mm. Yeah. And Ima is again a blue giant star. Uh, it's got a luminosity of about 10,000 times that of the sun. 
But it's also a, what we call a variable star. It fluctuates in brightness. And indeed, the reason for this, the star is so active that it's actually expelling outer layers and blasting them into space. Right? And so it's got this nebula. And the ultraviolet radiation from the star illuminates it into a glowing mass. Right? Mm. So again, this is a, probably a star that's not too far away from beginning to turn into something like a red giant or something like that. So what is the mechanism behind a variable star? Well, in most cases, it, it can be two things. It can be explosions on the surface or it can be pulsations. The, the actual surface of the star is changing, so it's pulsating. Yes. Oh, and sometimes it can be a combination of those things as well. Yeah. Yes. And how fast does, uh, does a star vary in, 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 in its brightness? Oh, this one's quite rapidly. But when I first became interested in astronomy, I, um, I became really interested in variable stars. And I joined, yes. in, back in Britain, I joined the Variable Stars Association. <laughs> and all I had was a pair of binoculars, but I used to observe these stars changing in brightness. And, so, and then you could begin to plot them. Once you observed them and you measured their brightness, you could begin to plot them and you got this wave pattern. So some were regular, yes, but some were irregular and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to learn. We might have to talk oh, yes. about variable stars as well. Anyway, just to remind you of a few things. Um, first of all, Stonehenge is open just on weekends at the moment from 10 to 4, except there's a, a, a guided tour. Guided to or sell a Star Trek laser Something tours. like that, yeah, mm. that's right. And of course, what we have got coming up when we will be opening is on Thursday is the winter solstice. In daylight hours, the shortest day of the year, all right, mm. which we often call midwinter. And we're going to be starting the program at four o'clock in the evening. The reason for that is, is that people will like to come out and they can actually see this if the sky is clear and it's heading that way at the moment. Just hoping. <laughs> uh, you will be able to work, see the sun set at the hinge at the solstice over a particular stone, right? And I'll be out there uh, playing my flute. Yes. Uh, and the sun goes down. <laughs> And music and so on. Give it a little bit of atmosphere. Yeah. And then, then after the, seeing the sunset, we'll, we'll have a special presentation on the on the stories behind. What was the solstice? Well, you might be actually surprised because just about yes. every major religious festival in the world is related either to a solstice or an equinox. So we'll be going to talk about the legends of the winter solstice. Winter solstice was always pretty important to ancient people. Oh, yes. I mean, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, if you were freezing your butt off without any heat pumps, etc., you were pretty keen on the fact that the sun was going to come back again. And grow food again. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't they have heat pumps in those days? <laughs> well, <laughs> only somebody who was rather inclined to talk too much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so then after that, hopefully, if it's clear, we can all, we're going to have some live music after that. Yes. And then <clears throat> I think Stefan's coming along as well. Yep, we'll have Stefan Brown. Yeah. <clears throat> and then hopefully we might even better take you out and show you some stars beneath the skies at the time of the solstice. Bring some warm clothing. Yes. Yeah, and dress as if you're going to a farm, I say. Yeah, that's because right. Because yeah. we don't mind people having gumboots on and things. And sometimes when you've got that kind of thing, you can step off the pathway if you want to. Yeah. It doesn't pay. Goodness sake, don't wear high heels. I've seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Okay. And, and you can see Odin there uh, flying over Stonehenge. Well, he's actually related to things that happen out there as well. So not allowed to tell the story. We're not moment. telling any stories until no. the time of the, the Come along solstice. and hear the story of Odin. And, Odin and many others. And the well. winter yeah. solstice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot more interesting <laughs> than you think. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, folks, well, I'm going to shut up now and we'll uh, catch you up in the not too distant future. On, hopefully on Thursday. Remember, for start time four o'clock if you want to see the sunset. Anything else to anyone to add? No, there might be singing bowls, they might not. We'll just see. Okay, folks. <laughs>